Okay, first and foremost, how does this sound? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, Terry, thank you for the introduction. It is much appreciated. Um, and speaking of introductions, before we get further into this evening, this talk, I'd like to make an official land acknowledgement. Um, there were peoples before us thousands and thousands of years before us to this day. They were the indigenous, and specifically in this area, they were the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek peoples. They are the traditional custodians of this land that we are on right now, right here today. So I'd like to move forward with this evening with that respect in our mind, as many of those people still live, work, and play here in Niagara Region to this day. So once again, thank you for the introduction. Thank you to the Niagara and the Lake Library. This is actually um, a double first for me this evening. Um, I've never done a talk publicly in this library before, which is a true honor as a local. Um, because I've done, and been fortunate to have done, many public speaking gigs about environmental, biological, and eco-political sort of subjects over the time, but this is the first time in my hometown library, so it's a real pleasure. And I'd like to thank the Live and Learn Talk series and Terry again for reaching out to me and getting this organized. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here in person. I think it's my third or fourth in-person talk since post-COVID times, so it's a real treat. And without further ado, I'm gonna take us on a visual and informational journey um, that pertains mostly to the Niagara region with a narrowed down focus eventually on specifically Niagara on the Lake. Um, just a show of hands, who here is a hometown resident of Niagara on the Lake? So majority of us, okay. And there's a few that maybe are coming from outside areas, okay. Are we all from in Niagara region? Okay. Seeing nods, hearing nothing else, I'm assuming so. So again, we'll work with Niagara. We're gonna work down to Niagara and the Lake, our lovely municipality here, what makes it unique and special. And we're gonna to talk today about climate change. Now the funny thing is, um, I'll admit right off the bat that I'm not a climate change expert. So um, if that is bothersome to you, you know, that's, I'm sorry. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at climate change from a conversational standpoint. My background is a Bachelor of Science in Biodiversity, which literally means a diversity of life, which also means I'm not an expert at anything in particular. <laughs> so rather my expertise, uh, what I studied and what I engage with these days is how different functioning parts of the ecosystem from insects to moss to snakes to freshwater fish to trees and climate, for example, all interact together to make a net function, functioning healthy ecosystem. So that does pertain to climate change. But one thing I've always been interested in um, that I like to present in these talks and in my walks as well and teaching at the school board is how, how does our society, how does our species, Homo sapiens, interact with our environment? That relationship is very important and we're going to dive a bit into that today from a more conversational standpoint. And if anyone recognizes um, this photo right here, we're talking about the lovely Niagara Gorge. The vast majority of the photos you're about to see, um, I was fortunate to not only experience but take myself. Um, if stated otherwise, it will have a little blurb along the, the, photo, the bottom. I do not have pic pictures of Doug Ford personally or Justin Trudeau, but they do make an appearance, just a heads up. <laughs> it's gonna get wild. <laughs> so this evening and this generation's questions, which hopefully I can provide answers, and not even if answers, but at least a continued discussion for. Again, I wanna kind of narrow it down to how can Niagara and Lake be impacted directly or even indirectly, which I think is an important uh, topic for this evening, by climate change. And then we're gonna go about what cultural and local barriers exist to taking action because those barriers are reality and we wanna talk about those realities in terms of how we can get over them and uh, why should we bother or care. The most beautiful thing I see in front of me right now is tonight you have chosen to be here because you do bother and you do care. Could that be said for everybody outside this building? Realistically, no. But if we have a conversation, spend time doing what we're doing tonight, we can spread that around. Um, and lastly, of course, after all that conversation, there should be a subject on what's next and how can we act. So I'll wrap this up with some suggestions on what we can do personally as a municipality in Niagara and Lake, but also generally, again, as a species. I like to look at things that we are a part of nature versus apart from it. We are just another species. We do things very differently. All I have to do is look around the room and see how we do things differently. We have a disproportionate impact on the environment at an immediate physical level, but we are also the only species that is single-handedly contributing to the rate of change with climate change. So I'll start off by saying, in summary, climate change, which used to be colloquially more called global warming, you can still say both, but there's a barrier to the word global warming. It's almost too literal for a lot of people. Well, it's cold here today or it was cold this winter. Where's the warmth? 
The reality is, though, we'll dive into this into the meat and bones of it a little bit later, is how the global temperature of the Earth as a mean temperature overall is rising and has risen basically exponentially in terms of rate since the industrial age of humans, since we started burning fossil fuels and deforesting the daylights out of our planet. So we'll talk about that, um, but it will not be all doom and gloom. There will be a sense of wonder to install that as well. So when I was in the University of Guelph, um, I did study some aspects of climate change, and I spent a lot of that looking at other areas of the world, funny enough, because I have an exploratory mindset. Um, for those who know me, I spend way too much time on Google Earth. It's probably the only screen time I don't get bored of. Um, and it kind of piques my interest to go, well, what's happening in this area of the world? What's happening in India? What's happening in Australia, South Africa, Spain, etc.? cetera? Um, and I remember talking about how elephants are affected by climate change um, in India because of the melting glaciers in the Himalayan mountains, less water and less quality of fresh water running down said mountains. Therefore, it's depleting the quality of the forest. The people are getting more desperate, so they're deforesting even more. Elephants have human conflicts. You can see how these chain link reactions happen, and it ultimately impacts elephants. But we do not have elephants in Niagara region, so my pun today is there's an elephant in the room in Niagara Lake. <laughs> so thankfully, and very thankfully, and I'm sure we're all aware of this, and maybe some need reminders outside this building today, but we do really live in the top 1% of the world. We can't sugarcoat that. We are so, so lucky. Um, the word that comes to mind for me is stability. So we are stable in terms of climate thanks to the Great Lakes and our global geography. The Great Lakes, especially the Niagara Peninsula here, being nestled between Lake Ontario to our north, right out the door here essentially, and Lake Erie to the south of the peninsula. What those lakes do is they spend our long warm summers warming right up, and then as the cool temperatures at this time of year start to creep in as you know our seasons change into fall and then into winter, those warm lakes being liquids take a lot longer to cool down with it. So they pump continued warm air onto our mainland here in Niagara for several weeks longer than other areas of southern Ontario. Um, and that actually gives us a longer, warmer, growing, and more stable season. The Niagara Peninsula breaks up a lot of storm systems that come from our west statistically, and it dissolves them before they hit Niagara. How many of you here seen or watched a radar where Hamilton, London, etc., is getting pummeled, and then the storm just kind of fizzles out when it gets to Niagara. <laughs> happens all the time. Farmers either love it or hate it because they want the rain, and when we want it, we don't seem to get it. And when we do get it sometimes, we get it big time. We'll talk about that too as well. So we got the Great Lakes. We sit in a latitude of the planet that has four very balanced seasons. Statistically, not every area of the world gets that luxury. We have stable politics, for the most part. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. Um, that's changing too, but at the end of the day, we still really do. And luckily, that allows for pretty open discourse for the time being between citizens, scientists, and our elected officials. There's lots of room for improvement in that regard too. That is a hindrance to climate change action. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then, you know, here in Niagara Lake, again, counter lucky stars, we have a stable affluence and quality of living. Um, we are, again, in a fortunate area of the world where we aren't faced with the atrocities and horrors of war or, you know, violence or poverty in severe ways compared to other areas of the world. We are not perfect, but we are pretty darn lucky. So these are kind of things that I believe and have noticed over the time growing up in Niagara that may give a bit of apathy towards climate change as a conversation taking action because we've got it made. We really do. Doesn't mean that the storm is not figuratively at our front door yet. <clears throat> it's getting closer. So I have this little picture I took uh, a few months ago of a coyote, <coughs> excuse me, running away down the tracks. And I like the figurative kind of image of this photo. The coyote is the conversation and I'm trying to get a photo of it and it's not gonna be able to run away. Eventually, I'm gonna get that and here we are today. <laughs> So we're going to just kind of look back into kind of what, for a moment, my expertise is with biodiversity and how that pertains to Niagara and how that is going to be impacted by climate change as well. Because it's not just the human impacts we have to be concerned about, it's the impacts directly on nature and biodiversity. And then what do you know? Humans and biodiversity, we are part of it and we are inextricably connected. So what we do to the environment is basically a reflection of what we're doing to ourselves. Even if we don't notice it right away, it's absolutely a reflection. So when you look at Niagara region, for example, on a map or specifically a satellite image, you would notice it's a mosaic of greens, two types of greens specifically, dark green, these little patches, little, of remaining forests and wetlands and those sorts of natural habitats. 
lots of light green, which is agriculture, generally speaking, and then you got these clumps of gray, urban and developed and built up areas. We have a mosaic, a balance of all of the above. And if you look at or consider where we are, we're a part of what's called the Carolinian forest. Raise your hand if you've heard of that term before. You've just heard of the term. Well, that's fantastic because I, I really do think even just 10, 20 years ago, that term was not as uh, forthcoming or people weren't as educated about it. So it makes me happy to hear that. A lot of people are aware of this forest. It's the most biodiverse or species rich forest or ecosystem in all of Canada. Not just Ontario, but all of Canada. It's in less than 1% of Canada's land mass and area and it has a quarter of our human population. So that sets the stage for a very interesting conversation about conservation, and I'm gonna talk about later how climate change ties into this unique setting we have here. So just to kind of start zoomed out, we've got North America. There's a tiny, tiny green dot right there. I don't expect you to see it. It just goes to show you that that's where Niagara Lake is. We're gonna zoom in a little further. What I shaded now, again, very small, is more of a bright green area, a little larger, and that is the Carolinian forest zone. So if it's hard to see on the map, that is almost exactly the point. It takes up less than 1% of Canada's landmass. Now, if you were to figuratively shade that light green I put there down over the border in this direction, you would shade all the Appalachian Mountains right up to northern Florida and southern Georgia. And again, those southern states, southeastern states, such as North and South Carolina, that's where the term comes from, Carolinian forest. Those species of plants and animals that enjoy the places we like to flock to as Canadians in the winter, snowbirds, maybe there's some of us in the room today, uh, but they are living at their most northern limit right here successfully because our winters are relatively short and weak and our summers are quite long with a longer growing season. Those are things that we're gonna get to in a bit that will be impacted by climate change around here quite likely. To zoom in even further, we got a third of Canada's rare and endangered species in that highlighted area, which is a remarkably strong number, small but mighty. So that's a small geographical area with relatively a ton of our rare and endangered species. Again, setting the stage, as you can see, lots of light green, lots of gray in there, not a lot of dark green patches. Those are our little remaining reservoirs for protected spaces. And there's that satellite image that I was talking about. Now, this does have to do everything with climate change because Southern Ontario is one of the most developed regions, not just of the province, but also even North America. So with so little, in fact, 90% of our original <coughs> forest and wetland coverage has been removed. So in that note, that means you have a lot less natural coverage that would sequester carbon. So forests, especially old growth forests and wetlands of various types, we have marshes, swamps, fens and bogs, the main four wetland types all on the peninsula. Around the world and here in Niagara, they are among the best types of ecosystems to sequester or take in carbon from the atmosphere, which we routinely continue to pump up into the atmosphere by burning it off. Again, a lot of this has to do with our cultural apathy to make big changes soon. So without all these dark green blotches, like Short Hills Provincial Park here, Waynefleet Bog down there, Humberstone Marsh, Thundering Waters, etc. Without those, we're not absorbing as much carbon, but also we are basically exposing more of the earth and it's lighter, drier colors, such as grays, for example, and colors do matter. We are literally absorbing more sunlight, more heat, and we will eventually be drying up a little bit more, which is bad for soil quality as well. And being farming community in Niagara Lake and Niagara region as a whole, that has implications. It also has implications back to what I study first and foremost, our species at risk, there's 54 um, at the moment. That number is likely even a little bit higher since I made this particular slide a few years ago. So both the environment's being impacted and so is our <coughs> culture and way of living. Yeah, is your hand up, sorry? When you say species, do you mean animal species or plant species or what kind of species? Both, both your plants and animal species are categorized as species at risk. And that's an official categorization that the government creates and basically says this is their official label and here are the protections that come with them. And those, those evaluations are brought forward every year to see if that species moves from you know, vulnerable to endangered to critically endangered and you never want to see the word extinct, but that's where things do head with climate change and habitat loss. So when we lose habitat, we are essentially not only harming biodiversity, we're harming ourselves in the meantime. 
So, for example, Niagara region here, these are all nationally high numbers. We have 70 species of trees. Certainly there are more trees in British Columbia and Northern Ontario, but we have one of the highest numbers per region of anywhere in the country, not just Ontario. The Carolinian forest zone as a whole has about 90, 70 of which reside here in Niagara. Bird species, there are over 400 bird species that have been logged along the Niagara River corridor. At the end of this presentation, I'll list them all off for you alphabetically, so I hope you stick around for that. <laughs> it's gonna be a hoot, pun intended. So, that's another national high. In fact, the Niagara River corridor, just over here, is listed as an internationally important bird area. Sounds like a very boring title, but that has a lot of international oomph to it. That's the kind of titles that the Everglades get, the Pantanal wetlands in South America get, Australia's oldest rainforest has this title too, South Africa, etc. So we have a world-class birding environment right here in our own backyard, which is pretty awesome. Um, quick side question, has anyone seen any bald eagles on the Niagara River the past two or three years? A few of us? Yeah, they've made a little bit of a, co a comeback during COVID times. It has nothing to do with that, but in the cycles of predators and prey, they have been making a bit of a comeback, so that was quite nice to see. Reptiles and amphibians, on that note, my personal favorite species, 55 species in the region. So there's a lot of riches at stake here with unique environments such as Niagara Gorge, which you can see here. We have the United States on the right, can on the left, and then this massive river that has taken 12,000 years to carve that gorge out. On that note, 12,000 years just to carve it out, but the actual rock layers going down as sedimentary rock are 420 million years old. Now, this is an interesting conversation to bring that number up because scientists have looked back in time well before humans existed and have evidence of how the climate has changed in cyclic nature for millions and millions of years. The Earth, yes, has warmed before. Yes, it has cooled before. We've had multiple ice ages. We have multiple extreme heat and desiccation ages too. So there's an argument, or perhaps an argument, but a rhetoric out there where people will say, well, the climate's always been changing. They are right, but what they may be missing the point on, perhaps, is the rate of change is what is very concerning. We are driving the rate of change of climate change, heating and warming, as humans, also known as anthropogenic, meaning human-created climate change. And that rate is unsustainable for those species at risk that I just mentioned, for example, to keep up with. And ultimately, it's going to be unsustainable for us to keep up with. As homo sapiens, we cheat the system. We're intelligent. We have buildings. We have air conditioning. We can grow food in the laboratory. We have medicine. We can cheat the system for a while, but eventually it's going to come back and bite us in the butt. So there's two kind of angles of thought, and then this evening as the conversation moves on, I'd like to combine the two. Because everybody in life, respectfully so, wears a different lens in how they look at the world, and how they might look at something as grand, um, and sometimes as contentious as climate change. So climate change, for one, could matter, and does matter, for homo sapiens, us. So some people need to, I found, especially over the years doing a lot of eco-political theme talks, is people need to hear, and rightfully so, this isn't a comment of judgment, it's, it's in our nature. What's in it for us? Why should I care? Why is this gonna impact me and my family? And if it doesn't, why am I paying attention to it or changing my lifestyle to it? We'll get into that later. And then there's another angle of thought, I personally share both very strongly, is that there's an inherent value to protecting our species here. So there's a kind of term that floats around where you call it speciesism, where our species prescribes itself as being the dominant living thing on the planet. And in fact, we have shaped the planet more than any species ever has and likely ever will. So, we need to look at what are we actually removing in terms of value? It's not only a biological question, but to go off the deep end here for a, more, a moment, it's perhaps a spiritual question. Why are we above the blue-spotted salamander, or the monarch butterfly, or the tulip tree, or the sassafras tree? So. Do we care? Do we lose sleep over the fact that these things get pushed aside while we continue to succeed and grow forward? I think that's something that needs to be addressed. So you, there's a possibility and reasons to care for both, because again, what we do for ourselves and do for other living things is all connected. So on that note, we're gonna go through a few barriers to, cons to the conversation itself, because they do exist. And when I was making this presentation, like I said, it's a brand new presentation, and uh, no one's walked out of the room yet, so that's good. Um, 
I, was, I kind of want to take an angle as not being a climate change expert per se. I know the basics, I know the logistics, I know the science is in and it's real and I can talk about it confidently enough. But I'm more concerned about how do we talk about it more? What's the psychological barrier and why does it matter? So I want to get to the words of global warming versus climate change. You could use both. But initially, as, I'm, as everyone in this room I'm sure remembers, especially when Al Gore made his incredible documentary, um, its name escapes me at the moment, but I'm sure many of you remember this. That's when I think global warming really took off as a term that people could address and get you know, behind and want to be interested in. And then what happened though, is global warming kind of took on a life of its own in some spheres of the public, where the word warming was taken very, very literally. And sometimes as Canadians, it might be hard to believe because we live in one of the coldest countries in the world. So you hear these kind of comments, and no, I'm not quoting any of my friends or family here, so it's all good. But just, I've heard these conversations before, and not in any defensive way, but you know, someone might say, we just had one of the longest and coldest winters on record. Recently, perhaps somewhere in northern Ontario, or in BC, or deep freeze out east. Or for example, who remembers two years ago, I believe, when Texas had an ice storm that knocked out a quarter of its power grid, and people actually died. So you could have people, for example, down in Texas, or even anywhere in the world who see that and go, Texas just froze over. You're trying to tell me global warming is real? Where's the warming happening there? But this is where the term warming, I think, personally, needs to be phased out and we need to stick with just climate change, which is caused by the global warming. And also, you know, you could say this town just broke a record for the coldest night is ever recorded, case in point again, the Texas ice storm of 2020. And those are scenarios that are freak scenarios. When the climate changes, because it warms in different pockets so intensely since the pre-industrial age, um, what happens is it changes patterns such as jet streams and how ocean currents can carry more moisture, for example. So you have extreme colds dipping down to places they wouldn't and extreme heat dipping up into the north where it normally wouldn't either. The jet stream gets more distorted and it traps that cold and warm air in deeper pockets where it normally would not statistically reach. So I would personally like to see a more of a shift of moving away from the term global warming. Nothing wrong with it, it could stay, but climate change I think is more realistic day-to-day -day conversation. And that photo right there is just a lovely spot along our local Niagara Escarpment. That was a very cold day, but global warming is still real. <laughs> Anyone recognize this village? I took this uh, shot through one of my drones years ago through the fog. Any, any takes on what village that is? Give you a hint, it's within the boundaries of our municipality. Queenston. Yeah, it's definitely Queenston. Lovely little village, rich in history, rich in biodiversity too. Queenston itself is actually a Carolinian forest hotspot. A lot of very rare natural trees in there. So we, where we live in the world, in Niagara-on-the-Lake, and generally this area of Ontario and North America, again, there's a lack of visual immediate impacts here. And when something is not apparent to us, you know, out our front door, our back door, right in our face, we might not be, in fair enough, inclined to make steps or take action accordingly. So we live in this area of the world where you can say, my Netflix works, my microwave works, I sleep in a comfy bed every night, I have air conditioning, I have heating, I have internet, this burrito tastes amazing. So we live a life of comfort and luxury, and that sometimes can, I think, again, make us apathetic or indifferent to how climate change is affecting things differently. Because not yet, luckily and truly, Climate change has not shown its ugliest side here in Niagara Lake yet. And that has to do again with, for the time being, our geographical stability and where we are. But I'm gonna talk about how outside influences eventually are gonna come in. And then a lot of us, again, looking kind of on a note of living in a very fortunate area of the world, we live in a beautiful town, we don't get hit with severe natural disasters very often at all. We don't have floods that wash away houses yet, maybe. We don't have extreme heat waves like the one in BC this past summer, or the summer prior, but there was a heat wave in BC recently during COVID times that killed more people than COVID-19 in a brief period of time, a heat wave that BC had never seen the likes of before. So that's something that really needs to be considered. That was something unusual for them. It actually created a, a death toll. And that hasn't come here yet to Niagara region. We get our heat warnings, we get our heat advisories, they can struggle to kind of work with, you know, in day-to-day -day life, it's hot and humid, and the air is sticky and polluted. We can expect more of that, though. Um, so we are sheltered from the time being from natural disasters. Doesn't mean, though, again, that they could never happen here. 
and or that outside influences will eventually impact us. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Won't spend too much time on this page. You want to look at nature again? I understand. It's okay. About that. But politics is a serious barrier to the conversation about climate change. And one thing that really bothers me is watching how over time, like a lot of modern day issues, things become politicized overnight. To me, that's really bothersome, and it becomes ineffective at people creating real, actual change in a direction we all need to move into. And, you know, it's one of those things where, for example, it can be interpreted as an agenda. So one of the things that I found very interesting, which I followed in the news recently, and I don't think it got too much coverage in Canada, but there were large farmer protests in the Netherlands, there were large farmer protests in New Zealand. New Zealand, actually, their government tried to put, I can't make this up, a burp and fart tax on their cattle to reduce <laughs> methane emissions and reduce also the cattle's herd sizes so we wouldn't have as much impact on the environment. <coughs> and then the Netherlands, it was something to the effect where the Netherlands government said, you can only use this much nitrogen and phosphorus-based fertilizers now to protect our waterways, and we also want to reduce our carbon footprint by shrinking cattle sizes. So in theory, I'll be the first to tell you right now on the record, all these things sound fantastic in terms of being steps forward and government taking steps forward to make these things happen because they do need to happen. We don't need more phosphorus and nitrogen in our waterways. We could probably do with smaller cattle sizes and whatnot and, and all that. But the problem is we're only a human species and we have this funny thing that another species doesn't have called a livelihood with this thing called money. And what happens is when, in any case, people feel like the government has infringed on their livelihood, they're going to get defensive. So what I think the governments did wrong, but right in that scenario, let's start with the right. They have the right science to call these sorts of shots. They have the right general benevolence and ambition to look forward in the world and have less environmental and climate change impact. I'm the first here to say I totally, totally agree with that. However, I'll also be first to say, if you're going to impose these quick switches, which we do need in society, because we're heading down irreversible climate change, basically recovery, if we keep this up, you at least need to, I believe, you have to respect the livelihoods of people, and if you're going to bring in a hammer on something like that, you need to support those people, be it farmers or anybody, whether it's through financial incentive, financial reimbursement, you need to support these people so they can keep putting food in their plate, or else they're gonna go, this is just a big sham to crush my livelihood. And I've, we've started to see that, and there'll be more of it coming as time moves on. I just hope the governments of the world look out for it. Now, on the bottom here, I listed a bunch of news sources, and in no particular order, just to be clear, don't want anyone getting too fired up here. But what I find interesting is if you watch them all objectively and you step back, they all have a totally different angle and rhetoric on the exact same issue, and I think that's dangerous. That's where you create division, and that's where you create people getting on opposing sides, and that's when you're not going to get people to come together and want to tackle climate change seriously. So I think our media outlets and the powers that be need to do a better job at unifying a message, not scaring people, and looking out for the people at the same time. I think it's possible, but maybe that's just me. So, back to the reality, in summary. Um, although the climate has changed by cooling and warming over literally millions of years, um, we've drilled through, for example, those 420 million years of rock, and the scientists can do a nifty little trick called carbon dating. It has nothing to do with dating the rocks or anything strange like that, um, but it has to do with figuring out the date at which those rocks existed and how much carbon content was locked up and fossilized and stored inside them. And they can actually get an idea through rocks and also ice cores from the Arctic, for example, and Antarctic, and glaciers, on carbon readings, and they can see and study how much carbon was in the atmosphere in previous periods of the planet. So on that note, except the science is in, the majority of the Earth's, the Earth's surface and oceans, so surface as a total, liquid or solid, has warmed by greater than one degree since the pre-industrial ages. So I looked at a map recently, actually, and it, it seems to be that only a few select areas of the world have been spared from not warming, and they're kind of these um, randomized sort of little blobs out in deeper parts of the oceans, not near the mainland, that have actually cooled just a little bit. But that does not compare to the other 90% of the ocean, more or less, that has warmed, and the land has warmed just about almost everywhere considerably. So this is a problem. The global temperature is literally raising little by little. And we may think that one degree is just such a tiny number, the number one. 
But think about how much of the world, especially in the northern southern hemisphere, or glaciers in the mountains, for example, have an average mean temperature that hovers around negative one. There's a lot of the world like that. So all of a sudden, you change negative one to zero, we know what happens, ice turns to water, water runs away, it evaporates, and it's never used again or frozen again the same way. So one degree really does make a difference. It's not an exaggeration, and that's why areas like you know, the far north of Canada and whatnot, we have permafrost, where the average temperature, a mean temperature hovers around negative one or zero. That mean temperature is now 0.5 positive degrees Celsius. That permafrost is melted, that is a loss of livelihood for the people that live up there. That changes the climate and the plants that grow up there and the ecosystem interactions within that. And also permafrost holds a heck of a lot of carbon inside of it too. Once it thaws, it's released up into the atmosphere. And as we continue in places like Niagara or Brazil does with the Amazon to deforest the daylights out of these places, we're not only putting more up in the air, we have less tools at the ground level to suck it back up. So it's kind of a negative cycle. So again, the impacts of climate stability and severity, it globally harms humans and biodiversity alike. One harms the other. We're all connected. So a few quick facts. Uh, this photo actually the top right and bottom right were taken along the shores of Lake Erie. Um, and basically what I want to get here, just a few little points here. I didn't want to bombard you too many numbers today, but just a few that I thought were important. So for example, there is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than any point in recorded human history. So, since the industrial age, we've gone from 278 parts per million to 417. That is almost a doubling in a relatively short geographical time frame. Our species has done that. Was the Earth already on a warm-up trajectory to begin with? Apparently and historically, yes it was, and that's fine. It's been doing that in cycles for millions of years. But now just imagine if my hand was the graph, it's going, going, humans are right here, comes to humans, and then it's going like this. That's essentially what's happening. And that rate of change is not sustainable. So we've doubled the amount of carbon dioxide nearly in the time that we started burning fossil fuels. Extreme heat events, which I touched on earlier, the more frequent and severe, so what, what was once, <coughs> accordingly, a one in 10 year heat wave, now happens with the statistics of 2.8 times in 10 years. Those are the odds of it happening. We need to look no further than what we saw all over the news with Europe <coughs> over the past year. How many remember hearing about that in the news? <laughs> and again, that's, that's, so that reached over here, and again, that I know I was kind of picking on the news earlier, but in reality, I'm glad they covered this event because Europe is a fairly modernized society, of course, too, and they were suddenly quite prone to extreme heat waves, the kinds that they haven't seen before, and they were literally lethal. The UK and France and Spain shattered records of daily highs in temperatures and prolonged heat wave periods. So that's pretty unusual, and apparently these are things that we can expect to have more often, and of course what happened in British Columbia during COVID as well. Sea levels are rising and they're warming. So as the global surface warms, so does the water as a mean temperature in our oceans. So you may have heard that you know, climate change contributes to stronger storms, and it's so true. And how that happens is, as the warmer water gets, the more prone it is to evaporating more aggressively. So it can feed a storm system more quickly and with more energy than a cold water system could. So that's a real problematic situation for storm severity in places, for example, such as Florida, with the most, hur most recent hurricane that it got rocked by, and we have typhoons in other areas of the world, and cyclones in places like Australia and Papua New Guinea. All these storms, the longer they sit and kind of fester over increasingly warm waters, they're getting energized even faster. It's like, here's, your, here's a kid's toy, let's put regular batteries in it, it only drives this fast. Let's put some super powered batteries in it and the thing takes off and it's out of control. So our warmer water temperatures really do enhance the power of our storms. So that's obviously gonna have a drastic impact on literal human death toll, which is of course the worst thing imaginable. But such storms, who remembers in the news what happened to Pakistan recently? Mm -hmm. Apparently nearly a third of that country's land surface area was underwater, which is unfathomable. So when you think about that, that's pretty unusual. That hasn't been recorded in modern recent history in the country of Pakistan. We can expect more events like that. And of course, before human-induced climate change, there were severe floods, there were severe fires, 
and things of that nature. Now we're just having more of them more frequently. So that is problematic, and that's where we start to hear the conversation about how we contribute to making a storm stronger. And again, coming back to conversation and barriers to conversation, sometimes we need to be cautious in how we word that, because if you just had one severe thunderstorm here in Niagara on the Lake, someone could say, well, that was just a severe thunderstorm. We get one of those every 10 years. How is that climate change? These have happened here before. But when they're happening more often and more frequently, that's when you start to need to look at the stats and go, wait, this is becoming a more frequent event. And such storms, severe thunderstorms here in Niagara and the Lake, or perhaps a massive hurricane or cyclone system, not only do they have human impacts on you know, quality of life and death toll, but they can ruin agricultural systems, they can wipe out cattle, they can destroy infrastructure and power, they can change the landscape and make things difficult to grow on. So these are important things to take note of. And then plants and animals, going back to Again, what I studied first and foremost, biodiversity, they can't keep up with this rate of change sometimes. So this doesn't apply to Niagara and the Lake, but just to give you a global example, when I was filming Hidden Corners down in Ecuador, there is a series of mountains where the Amazon rainforest meets the Andes Mountains. It's one of the most special places in the world. And what's really interesting is that per mountaintop, there are species of, you name it, from crayfish to tree frogs to snakes to salamanders to even something as specific as a vine or an orchid, that will only grow on this mountaintop, nowhere else in the world. And then here's a valley, here's another mountaintop, you have another collection of species that only live there, sometimes even down to only the western slope, and then found nowhere else in the world. So what's happening, being a mountaintop, the top being in that area of the world, covered um, with very little plant matter, it's kind of like short stubby vegetation, it's cooler, you're up in the clouds, cloud forest, down below, you have dense tropical rainforest with a tall double canopy feature jungle. So all these species are adapted at living down here, down here, down here, down here, or way up here. And what's happening is as the Amazon rainforest is actually getting too hot and warm and sometimes dried out, these species are trying to move up the mountain to adapt to the cooling environment. They go to the top where it's cooler and more moist, but as that lack of habitat, that lack of coolness and moisture at the top of the mountain or volcano, whatever it is, starts to disappear, these species are literally going extinct figuratively off the top of the mountain. They run out of space. There's nowhere else for them. They are cornered, not exactly in a corner, but the top of the mountain. And that's how climate change can affect species in other areas of the world too. And I picked the turtle because turtles around the world, including our snapping turtle here, they all have a special feature where when they lay their eggs, wherever they may lay them, that their eggs will hatch either male or female based on the ambient temperature. And down to a difference of a degree, depending on the species, or even half of a degree, what ends up happening is that dictates whether this is gonna be a male or female. Nature and its ways over the years, before we kind of started to mess things up a little bit, um, seem to have that in balance. But there's actually studies coming out of all areas of the world where turtles are starting to give birth to clutches of almost only males or almost only females because of increased temperatures in the area and the ground, therefore, as well. So it's all these little effects that we need to think of. So in Niagara Region, Niagara Lake, I think, on a more positive note, not only do we have something to, to protect, of course, which we'll get into, but we have something to celebrate. We live, for all the reasons I said earlier, in a very prosperous, beautiful, and lucky area of the world. We really do. Uh, but therefore, on the world stage, all eyes are on us. We are a tourist destination. We have one of the wonders of the world right here in our backyard. We attract millions of visitors every year, and we celebrate our hospitality, we celebrate our scenery, we celebrate our agriculture, we celebrate our fun urban environments, we celebrate our wine, yeah, God love it. We celebrate our breweries, our great lakes, and all these wonderful things. So why don't we take the world stage to celebrate how we tackle climate change? The eyes are already on us. It's an opportunity waiting to happen. So if there's any elected officials in the room tonight, I've always used to tell them, this is your chance to really say, hey, why don't we put Niagara Lake on the front stage for this as well? It's already on the front stage for all these other categories. Why not just add this one in there? I think it can be done. So having said that we live in this kind of microcosm of shelter for now, we can't be naive to climate change more severe impacts around other areas of the world, and that will eventually have indirect ripple effects here. We may, not have a, we may not have a storm that blows the roof of our houses or a flood that takes out an entire village anytime soon or a drought and a fire that scorches our orchards. That scientifically and statistically is not gonna happen anytime soon. 
thankfully. But in other areas of the world, as we know how interconnected and globalized the planet is now more than ever, if you have, for example, an area of the Middle East or Eurasia or Central America that is being disproportionately impacted by droughts, floods, etc., and it's affecting crops and fruits and foods that we rely on and want here, be it coffee, wheat, etc., and it's with the atrocities, for example, that are happening in Ukraine right now, for example, that's a war, but what I'm getting at is that's having impacts on agriculture over there. Climate change can do the exact same thing a war can do. And it can disrupt supply chains. It can cause limitations to how things get shipped around the world. And even here in peaceful, stable, plentiful little Niagara Lake, there could become a time where coffee becomes more scarce. Then we're gonna really go crazy. <laughs> this could be bad. So we gotta think about these sorts of things. It could be coffee, could be wheat, could be fruit, could be nuts, could be fertilizer, could be all these things that we depend on getting shipped from other areas of the world to make our lives satisfying here. So that comes down to supply chain issues. And then we have humanitarian issues. And again, not to get like overly political for a moment, but when you hear political rhetoric of people saying, oh, we don't want immigration, we don't want refugees, a lot of these sort of figures in politics are also pretty staunch, generally speaking. But they're against climate change too, don't believe it, and don't pour any energy, money, or effort into it. But that's really ironic, because that will come back to haunt them one day, because we're moving into a day and age where we're going to have a little something called climate change refugees. And that's not a little something, that's an area of the world, for example, you look at the most densely populated regions of the planet, like Bangladesh or in India, Southeast Asia, Central America, islands in the Caribbean, etc. And when sea levels rise, for example, or massive floods hit over and over again and make those places less livable, these people are going to do what our species, would, any species would do in a time of strife. They're going to try to migrate and find somewhere more fitting to live. So I always think it's ironic if you ever hear that political rhetoric, because one day by denying climate change, you could very well create a climate change refugee crisis as well. Because people need to eat, they need to drink water, and they need to be stable and sheltered somewhere. And when we're put in a corner, we're gonna find ways out and we're gonna to move to other places of the world. So that's something to consider as well. Here are the projections for Niagara on the lake. Thankfully, and again, we are lucky to live where we do, and right now we're relatively sheltered. So these impacts might not seem too severe right now, but this is kind of the extreme end of the spectrum is if we were to take our foot right off the gas and say, look, we're not gonna act fast enough or at all, Here's what Niagara Lake can statistically expect based on modeling and expectations for this region of the world. We will continue to get shorter and weaker winters. One thing that comes to mind for me, I mean, on a funny note, some people won't complain about that, okay? But we could get more invasive species. For example, in the southern states, they're predicting that by 2050, dengue fever could be commonplace in the southern states, where it generally isn't now. Right now, it's more so in the Caribbean countries and South America. I've had dengue fever. If I've had a worst enemy, I don't, but if I did, I wouldn't even wish it upon them. It sucks. So imagine that, for example, a product of climate change, that mosquito that carries that particular viral load can now live further northbound. And then we might have species that are considered not invasive for now, somewhere in the southeastern states, and let's say they start surviving a little further north and they take a liking to our apple orchards or our oak trees, or our cherry trees, or whatever it may be that we find of value around here. So that's a concerning one for me. Um, we can expect more extreme precipitation events in summer and fall. This can lead to crop and property damage. Um, again, nothing too severe. There hasn't been a house swept away in Niagara Lake yet, thank goodness. But what I've noticed over the years in St. David's, little old St. David's where I live very close to, is through aggressive urban development, and again, to be clear, and for those of you who may have read my articles, I often reinstate that I'm not anti-development. We are growing, our species is growing, but how do you do it smart to not impact the environment or set ourselves up for failure? And there, are, there have been a few times, which I have photos, and I could not for the life of me find this for the presentation, but across from the grist, Little Four Mile <coughs> Creek suddenly wasn't so little anymore, and it had swollen up to a torrent, and it was at the back door of those suburbs there, almost going into their basement doors. So we built a concrete bowl, and then we wondered why the water rushed in and flooded up. And if we get more severe storms combined with more aggressive, um, more aggressive development, which the Ford government within the last week quietly snuck on in. Anyone aware of that? Yeah. yeah. No, I can see some passionate nods there. Truly, it's, it's concerning because 
if we continue to build not so wisely and more aggressively as such, we are setting the stage for pairing that kind of irresponsible development with the more statistical incoming extreme precipitation events. And then we're going to go, why is there water in my basement? You might want to ask your provincial government that. <laughs> and then that will lead to poorer water quality as well due to heating and lack of forest coverage. So one thing I consistently talk about with Niagara Lake specifically, again, we have a lot to celebrate, but we have one thing we really, really need to improve on, and that's our local water quality. So even for the rest of Niagara region, the region doesn't do too well as a whole, but quite honestly, I can say a lot of positive things about Niagara Lake, and I always will, but our water quality is horrendous. The Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority puts out what's called a watershed report card every four years, I believe, and they literally grade our water systems from an A, B, C, D, like a grade school kind of perspective, and those are based off of parameters such as nitrogen and phosphorus content, algae content, E. coli content, um, turbidity, which basically just means how much sediment is in the water, um, suspended solids, um, which can literally mean anything from you know, massive clumps of bacteria created sort of messes, or literally human waste sometimes. And then we also have species of insects and amphibians that scientists will look for that we know will not tolerate poor water quality and will only succeed in high water quality. So I just kind of rambled off and listed some of those parameters they measure there, but the reason why Niagara Lakes watersheds like 2, 4, 8 Mile Creek, etc., consistently score D-level scores for the most part is because, again, going back to climate change, we've removed 90 plus percent of our forest and wetland coverage along these systems, so all of a sudden you have this projected more extreme precipitation events without these filters of forest and wetlands you have more soil and more of the chemicals used on our farms washing into the creeks at higher rates. Not only are we gaining that sort of chemical soup and mess into our waterways, we're also losing high quality soil that's being eroded and washed away as we get more severe events. Heavier, harder rains are gonna wash away more soil. That's just the basics of it. So this is difficult, again, you know, to imagine because it's, it's Niagara and Lake and our farm life and agricultural life is celebrated. And then there's higher pollution and frequency of smog days. So this is difficult literally for us as people. This is a direct impact that literally goes right into our lungs and our day-to-day -day lives stepping out the door. If we get longer, hotter days with less air quality, unfortunately now, we are basically lumped in with Toronto. Toronto has literally grown around the corner from Hamilton. It is now a continuous urban landscape right up until Eastern Grimsby. There's a little gap in Lincoln where there's a bit of countryside by the lakeshore. Then there's Big St. Catharines. Niagara Lake is actually one of the few remaining underdeveloped areas of Lake Ontario. But because that urban environment has snuck so far around, when we get extreme heat events and smog days, we're part of that bubble with Toronto and the GTA, and that does affect and impact our air quality here. That will only get worse as urban sprawl continues to cover the edges of the lake. In fact, fun fact, not so much about climate change, but the, um, the Lakeshore Park area, or conservation area on the lakeshore, that is the largest area, it's not even that big, for Niagara Lake it is, but it's not even that big. That is the largest area of continued wetland and forest all the way around to east of Pickering. So there's not a larger patch or chunk of woods from Niagara Lake to St. Catharines, Lincoln, Hamilton, Burlington, Oakville, Mississauga, Toronto, Ajax, Pickering. That's the last of it, it's not even that big. So again, that goes to show you the picture for Southern Ontario and how that's gonna affect air quality and water quality alike. When I give these talks though, um, it's funny because I remember when I first started at the school board, uh, somebody from a higher up position told me, which I kind of, kind of shrugged it off and I kind of went my own way anyways, they said, we don't want to talk to young kids about climate change because we don't want to scare them. <laughs> and I thought to myself, do you see what they watch on Netflix? <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> so I think it's totally possible to have that conversation in the right tonality and the right reality because those said kids that I was briefly told, that's been reversed since, briefly told not to talk about, they're gonna live with, more than anyone in this room, the brunt of our inaction. So I think it does need to be discussed and you can do it in a way that turns worry to wonder. And so looking at our biodiversity here in Niagara, all four of these photos are taken in lovely Niagara Lake. So this is along the Niagara River, 
We've got an area of forest here. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Browns Point along the Niagara Parkway. That's a lovely old historic woodlot, one of the last of its kind in the area. Beautiful if you have not seen it before. Um, this goes back to the uh, Lakeshore Park Conservation Area. Um, I was running a guided tour there that day. I took a family out with a bunch of little kids. And uh, you know what? They were from a homeschool group in particular that was very much so focused on presenting climate change, not in a worry and terrifying and scary way, but rather in a wondrous way. And that inspires the kids to not be spooked and go to bed and you know just hide from it. They in fact are the kids going out and setting up bat boxes and planting native tree species and doing gardening initiatives with local plants in the area. And they, they have their own little like fun, cute little YouTube channel where they talk about these things and they're happy while they're doing it. So that's a living example of how this is possible. Uh, down below on the left here, kind of hard to maybe tell on the phone on the screen right now, but that is a blue spotted salamander. That's a, those are its two eyes, big shiny head, beautiful creature. Those amphibians, if we continue to lose more forest coverage in Niagara and the Lake, which allows the sun rays to literally, and the UV rays to hit more soil, we start to dry the soil out and desiccate the Niagara and the Lake soil. Not good for agriculture, also not good for our salamanders and other local sensitive species. And then, just on a more positive and chipper note, look at those beautiful fall colors right there at Queenston area. Now that exact photo taken very close to the uh, queenston Lewiston border bridge, fun fact, if you ever go there, I want you to imagine next time you drive up and around there or walk through there, that's where Niagara Falls poured over the escarpment 12,000 years ago to this day. So imagine you yourself driving on east-west line where you can see, thankfully but not thankfully to our immense deforestation, you can see the escarpment way in the distance. Now imagine 12,000 years ago you'd see the waterfall plummeting over from east-west line. Pretty neat to imagine that. That's where it happened. <laughs> And then looking at Niagara Lake from a different context, civilization, us, the people, you being here in the library today, you know, whether you live in one of the older communities here, whether you live in one of the newer suburbs, we are all part of Niagara Lake, we are all growing together, and we all have a part to play. Um, I think about, you know, our tourism, people come here to drink our wine and enjoy themselves, kick back and relax, we're on the world stage, we can keep that up. You know, I took a Google Earth shot of Virgil here. You can see the Virgil Reservoir, for example. Um, I think that's kind of an interesting snapshot of Niagara Lake as a whole, almost. Because you see the mixture of agriculture, little pockets of natural areas, and then we have just a few spots in between, you know, urban this, urban that, and everything. And Virgil is growing, too. So we have this mosaic of a landscape we need to work with. We need to strike a balance with it. And then we've got our agricultural areas down below here, like in Lion and Concession Country. Springtime, the cherry blossoms are incredible. Um, I'd say it's one of the unsung wonders of Niagara for a few weeks there. It's truly beautiful. And on the note of truly beautiful, again, right at the brow of the Queenston Lewiston Bridge, there's the Niagara Gorge. And people want to come and see these places, understand them. And when people come and understand these places better, hence what you're doing tonight on that note, we are more inclined to respect these places and if you respect the place, in theory, you're also going to want to get behind tackling climate change because it will affect both, again, civilization and from the previous side, biodiversity. So I kind of come up with, it was really interesting for me making this presentation for the first time and giving it for the first time. And again, nobody's left the room yet, that's awesome. <laughs> but in no particular order, but kind of you know, going generally from larger scale, things beyond our control perhaps in this room, to things that we can do down to a local level. So first of all, when I was on the town's environmental advisory committee, it was full of incredible skill sets, incredible knowledge, and it was a really fantastic networking opportunity to discuss these things with other highly educated, smart, and enthusiastic driven people. And to the fault of nobody except the world of politics into itself, it moved so slow. <laughs> wow. Now, I thought that was an example of one of the barriers to taking climate change action more seriously. Not just Niagara Lake, this is not a Niagara Lake phenomenon. It happens in Fort Erie, happens in Toronto, happens at Queen's Park, happens on Parliament Hill. We have this, these meetings about meetings about meetings. And, and, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, if we could do what we did during COVID and have governments snap their fingers and apply really stringent measures right away, why can't we do that for climate change? We could. The power is there. Why couldn't we do it for that? So there is an option 
to move forward faster, how much faster we want to move forward though. That's up to our decision makers, and that's why when election season comes around, and once it just passed, I encourage you next time that time of the year comes around, get to know your local candidates, ask what their stance is on these things, and maybe they'll be more inclined to get that machine moving a little quicker, because it does need to move faster if we want to make real change. We need to invest in uh, clean, green, green, clean, energy quickly. Um, and I was actually pleased to know, full circle, back to the Niagara Lake Environmental Advisory Committee, when I was vice cha chair there for the one year, there are motions in the work for the town of Niagara Lake to invest in more clean technologies in terms of public transport, solar energy, better lighting that uses less energy and whatnot. So these ideas are there. And again, I don't have the perfect, you know, whisk of the wand solution to this, but I just wish it would move faster. This is a big one for me. Leave Niagara Lake's 10% of remaining forests and wetlands alone. That may sound like a very strong and abrupt statement, because there's a difference between conservation and preservation. Conservation is where you kind of work around the environment and work with it and make modifications and trade-offs where you can, with the goal of at least conserving something. Preservation is a bit more hardline. I believe Niagara Lake is in a position where we need to work more towards preservation. I use this analogy with the kids at school, and for those who have seen my presentation before, you're probably tired of hearing me talk about pizza, but if you had a 10 slice pizza, and you ate nine slices as a class, you better have a darn good conversation about that last slice of pizza. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're down to. We're down to the last slice, so I hope that conversation moves on forward. And also, those forests and wetlands, funny enough, are our greatest tools in the toolbox. They're free. They were created by nature thousands of years ago. They exist right under our feet, just here for us. And you know what they're doing? They're working as an ecosystem service to hold more moisture in the land, cool our landscapes during heat waves, and of course sequester carbon in the day and age of climate change, because that's what forests and wetlands do. So it's frustrating sometimes to me to hear, you know, elected officials here in Niagara Lake and beyond and in the world, not just Niagara Lake, talk about how we need to make this action plan for climate change. And it sounds great, it sounds cushy, it sounds awesome, but then we're deforesting and removing our last 10% of forests and wetlands that actually do that job for us, so it's kind of ironic. So governments, again, as I talked about earlier, they must support farmers and other industries during transitions, financially, if they want to bring in some more quick and perhaps more um, hard measures to curb climate change and environmental impacts. Again, I'm first here to say that I totally support that, but I'm also very much pro support your local people at the same time, or else you're just not gonna get along and we're not gonna move forward together. We need to celebrate and showcase visible success to inspire other communities. So, um, for example, Niagara Lake did a fantastic job at the Communities in Bloom uh, project and competition years ago. I was very fortunate to be a spokesperson for that when it happened. And as that happened, now we see around town all these beautiful signs by our beautiful gardens and planted areas where we are celebrating that. And that's one of those things where I think we should shamelessly flaunt it. Say, yeah, look what we did over here. This is fantastic. And then who's to say that Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, Welland, or Port Colburn doesn't look and say, hey, see what Niagara Lake's doing over there? Why can't we do that? So we can be a positive ripple effect of change. And again, we shouldn't be shy about those things if we actually do them. We want to, I want to see more plant, planted trees along our creeks in unused areas. By whatever avenue we can get a hold of such trees. And trees, again, cool our environment. They sequester carbon and they act as filters for our water quality as well. And trees over creeks, given that they shade creeks, will actually cool the water down. Cooler water is generally more oxygenated and allows more biodiversity as well. Um, locally, getting down to the wire here, we got from the top of the pyramid down to the bottom to you as the individual. Some of us here may have the ability, given the size of our property, and we all live under different circumstances, to rewild our gardens and yards. Um, I love my dad, he's not here tonight, but I think we have too much lawn. You can tell when we get home, Mom. But we have so much lawn, and lawn's a beautiful thing. I love lawn, but perhaps there's areas where, whether it's your res residential backyard, or whether you have a farm area where the back kind of just isn't used, but isn't anything special at the moment either, why aren't there incentives from the government to make it easy for people to just plant a bunch of trees? I, I don't think that needs to be a big barrier or conversation. It just needs to be an advertised avenue, and we can encourage people to do that. That if now. Think about it, Niagara region and Niagara on the lake, 90 plus percent of the land is private property. So there's a lot of power in the private property ownership. So if we have private property owners working together, imagine the change we can make together. 
And then, of course, buy what you can locally. That's a big one, it always should be for both the moral and economic reasons, but also environmentally. When you buy locally, you are taking out the giant ship that came over from Asia, you're taking out the transport truck that drove up from Florida, and you're taking out the uh, two trucks that drove up between warehouses in Niagara around here. And sometimes you're literally driving just five minutes or five seconds away from this library figuratively, and you have the fruit that you're looking for right there, or the bread that you're looking for right there. And so I think that's an important one too. So you're actually indirectly um, picking, or sorry, taking away those variables of movement that all burn fossil fuels to do that, and you're supporting local at the same time. It's a win-win. I think the most important thing to do above all, though, that we can all do in this room, and again, why I'm thankful to see so many of you here tonight, is uh, we can keep talking about climate change. So this is something, you know, maybe you learned something today in my talk, and I really, really hope you did, or maybe if it wasn't just learning something, maybe it was a different way of thinking about it and how we can go home, talk to our family and friends around the dinner table about these things, make it a discussion versus, you know, an argument or uh, something more intense about it. It can really be, kind of going back to the kids, something that goes from worry to wonder, and that's a mindset that I hope we carry out of the building this evening following this talk. And on that note, I believe that wraps things up. So, um, again, thank you all for coming out this evening, and I would like to keep this discussion going right here, right now, but also in the bigger picture in general. All the information listed here is how you can get a hold of me, come on my tours, other speaking engagements, or any inquiries perhaps that come to mind following this, just a question or even a comment or story. You can always get in touch with me and that's what I'm happy to do here in Niagara and Lake. So on that note, that concludes my time from a presentation standpoint, and thank you everybody. Yeah, that's any that's comments? Good. So um, we really do have to be finished by about five to eight. So <laughs> yeah, you in the back there. Uh, yeah, you mentioned those uh, uh, about the water quality. I assume you were talking about just the feeding the rivers, not the drinking water. I'm new to the uh, town. Do you know whether the town reports on the quality of the drinking water? They do have, I, I can't give you the exact details like what the score is per se, but the good news is I know it's good and drinkable. Um, especially if you're in an urban area and not on well water, you can drink your tap water anywhere in Niagara and the lake. I don't know what the exact measurement or score is though, and they do measure these things, and I believe, unless someone here can correct me, um, the Niagara region is responsible for the quality of drinking water that comes out of our taps. So presumably if I go to the Niagara Region website, I can get that data for Niagara Lake, right? I would believe it's for the Niagara Region, yes. Um, does anyone else have anything for you to comment on that? We don't have Niagara Lake drinking water. We have St. Catharines drinking water. Our drinking water used to come from the Niagara River from the old pump house, which is now the art gallery. But one day they built a water pipe from St. Catharines without telling us that the water from the Old pump house wasn't drinkable anymore, even though a lot of us had not been drinking it for years. And so we get our water from Lake Gibson and Lake Erie, not from Lake Ontario, not from the local water. Thank you so much for sharing that. I was not aware of that, and that's something pretty fantastic that I've learned today. And I would never imagine that it works in that way, but there we have it. Okay. But I would think, back to your point there in the back, the Niagara region would have that data available. Yeah. I just want to clarify something that, um, that you said about the work that you do with children at the Outdoor Study Centre. Mm -hmm. You are talking about climate change with them? You have moved from worry to wonder? Yes. Or not yet? We have, yes. There is a, and again, I'm not here to say any names in particular, but I'm saying someone from higher up when I first got hired, literally before they said you're hired during an interview, said this is something we don't talk about here. Mm -hmm. I thought that was unusual. And again, I kind of shrugged it off and was probably going to talk about it anyways. It's um, in the curriculum. But, and, and now, and well, that's the interesting thing, is it's now in the yeah. curriculum. And again, it's, it's in the news every night now, too. And it's a discussion. It's a true global discussion. So we have moved on from that, thankfully, in a more open way. I was doing it from the get-go anyways. But now it's, it's been presented to say, yes, you can talk to kids about this. And I think okay. that's fantastic. And just supplemental to that, what do you perceive um, the attitudes of the children are uh, uh, that you work with uh, uh, about climate change. Like, do we have hope? 
I think we do. I think children, especially the, at the right age and with the right delivery, of course, which I think is key too, you can say these things without scaring them. And they, they, children want to do good and they almost want to be superheroes. And I'm going to talk about kids. They literally want to be superheroes. So when they see that there's something that they can rise to the occasion for or help with, they are generally speaking very keen to do it. I'm talking about younger kids too. And if you want to go a little bit up the ladder, because I work with kindergarten all the way until grade 12 and everything in between, the older kids, like high schools and grade 7 and 8s and whatnot, that's a treat to talk with them too, because you can talk to them as adults about it, like on that adult sort of level, and again, without scaring them or making it some kind of depressing picture. And you won't get all their attention, but the ones you do are going to want to move forward with it and do meaningful things, because they're at a point in their life where they're exploring interest. And perhaps, even if it's just two out of the 30 in the class that day that you really reach in a different way, they're the ones who are gonna go on in the world and study this, talk to others, and ripple that effect out. So generally speaking, full circle for kids, and I'm using this term loosely from kindergarten to grade 12 that I work with, I'd say it's largely a positive response versus a, oh my gosh, this is terrifying, I don't wanna hear about it. Um, I, I actually can't even think of a specific incident where someone responded negatively in the moment to those conversations. Yeah, so there, I like the word you use, there is hope, yes. Yeah, but it's people like Greta Thunberg who are leading this movement, really. It's the kids who are telling us that we've wrecked life for them. My question was, since we are so lucky, we're so spoiled, we're so comfortable, we're so well-fed, we're cool, we're heated, what should we be prepared to do without it? In Niagara Lake, everybody has to have a car. You can't go anywhere. My wife and I drove here tonight. We could have walk it would have taken 40 minutes, mm -hmm. but we're too spoiled, we drove. And so, it's nice to say we need to, promote, to preserve our environment. We have to start getting used to the idea of maybe doing without something, and I wondered where we should start. That's a fantastic question or, or, or idea to even explore too, because that's, that's now kind of going into human psychology. Even take climate change away, our comforts and our luxuries, such as having a car, like you said, I drove here tonight too, I burned fossil fuels to get here too. I think, again, it's going to come down to the point where I believe governments around the world are going to be instructed to bring in new regulations to people, and they have to do it in a way I believe that incentivizes people and makes it worth their time, worth their finances, and again, there's no like scientific measurement for this, but worth their happiness and comfort too, or else it's going to be very difficult and edgy to get people detached from the luxuries we've lived in. Um, so I, I totally think about this and stare at the bedroom ceiling all the time about what you just discussed because I am inadvertently guilty of the exact same thing. So we will have to, it won't happen overnight, those changes, which is good. If it happened too quickly, it would sh literally shock people and we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. But we almost need, uh, here's what's coming from the governments and the powers that be in the world. Here's what's coming. Here's what you can expect. Here's how we're going to help you along the way. And hopefully that's the ideal sequence that goes in. And there's also a bit of, I guess, we cross that bridge when we get to it, too. Mm -hmm. Yes? And if I can add to that, yeah, of course. Bit, think big, start small, go slow. Um, something we could all do without is the grass on our properties. <laughs> um, you know, mow. <laughs> um, it is a, mow. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mow, mow, stop mowing. It's a monoculture wasteland. Mm -hmm. it, 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 all you do is feed chemicals into it. All you do is waste water into it. It provides no food to any pollinator. It is a human vanity project. And I think we need to learn how to redefine beautiful. Mm -hmm. I like that. So again, that's more of a... Rewilding yeah. your gardens and yards. Absolutely. Yeah, our diet. Just eat less meat. I, uh, there's that too. Yeah. I wrote um, an article a long time ago, and it was kind of almost uh, a, a, a sci-fi look into the future where the government, and it's just, it's all hypothetical, this has not happened, but the government actually uh, aggressively incentivizes people and pays them out to help the environment. So the more bushy and jungly your front yard looks versus pretty flowers and a nice lawn, the government actually says, wow, this person's pulling their weight to you know, help biodiversity and help the sequestration of carbon, and uh, here's your reward for doing so. Thank you for being on board and helping with the societal issue. And, uh, I, and I wonder if there's like almost like a, a social credit score that may come down the, the hatch one day for people who really take the incentive and the initiative to help the environment and tackle climate change. And again, they can't do that overnight, 
or it would be met with literally probably a revolt. But if it happens slowly, and it happens with evidence that this is worth your while, and is financially, and like you said, like from a vanity standpoint, worth your while too, then perhaps it would be achievable, and I'd like to think it could be. It has to be done slow, steady, properly, and respectfully, though. Yeah? Uh, so, I work in the environmental science field, but I'm really curious about misinformation and spreading knowledge. So one of the things that is kind of a blessing and a curse of public the open media is that you can express your opinion any way possible. So anyone to go on Google can find their answer in the way they want. How, how do you see that we can combat this in the eyes of climate change? Well, that's an interesting point you bring up because also something I wrote about very recently a couple articles, articles ago is after COVID-19 on the world of Facebook and Instagram, Climate change is the most recent thing. COVID was the first one. Now, climate change is the second thing that social media, for example, tags and flags the moment you even mutter or post a word about it. So there are these sort of higher up powers and, and political plays at B that are trying to narrow down that information to avoid spreading misinformation. Because, again, it's, you said it perfectly. Someone can hear the one thing the right way just once, and they can just go, oh, I've heard everything I need to know, that's my opinion. It's, it's probably too scary for some of those people to actually do like actual research and dig deeper. <laughs> that's what happened with autism and the vaccines. It was actually one article that was published, and then a few years later, the same author retracted the statement. And from that point, we're still dealing with yep. like controversy with vaccination when the author himself has already retracted it. It's not right. Like yeah, and so I think the, those, those efforts need to be in place. I think they need to be careful, by they I mean, for example, like social media, media outlets, news, etc. They have to be careful with their delivery of it, because if it comes off, I agree with what you're saying, it needs to be controlled, that information, or else we're never going to get on the same page with it. But it, they have to almost watch their tone and how they do it, or else it can be seen as, you're forcing something onto me, right. and some people get their right. hair up on their back about that. So there's, it's got to be delivered with the right tone and the right style of messaging versus forced, forced, forced. Because when people get forced, 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 they can shy away or block away or look for something else. So I think it's necessary, and especially because climate change is literally, no matter who you are in the world, or whatever your political views are, whatever news station you watch, whatever social media platform you use, um, at the end of the day, climate change unites us all. We're all in this ride together more than arguably any other issue in the world. Mm -hmm. Great question. It's a, it's a modern times question, but it's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, sort of about technology. Is it a green option to take that hydrofoil to Toronto out of Port Dalhousie? <laughs> is it? Wait, sorry, one more time. Sorry. It's Port Well. Is it going to be a green option to take that hydrofoil to Toronto? Oh, that's the boat to talk about that goes across the water. Yeah, it's sort of starcraft. Right. But I mean, I'm thinking, oh, that sounds grand. We have buses that are come from. I just don't know the technology. Is that a green technology? I personally cannot speak to the details of that boat and how it operates. Geographically, it's a much shorter distance. I'm assuming this thing's going to run on gas. I don't know for sure, though, of sorts. Um, but it's a shorter distance, which means less people potentially burning off more carbon dioxide as they make their way around from Hamilton into the GTA and stop and go traffic with a bunch of hot vehicles on a hot road that is absorbing heat. So I think at the end of the day, yes, like very surface level, it would be more eco-friendly, but I can't speak to the logistics of how that boat operates. But um, it probably saves a lot of people a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I just didn't see anything in the media. I haven't it either, but I'd be curious to keep it on. It was that way. My second question is more, more general, because this is something that's come across my writer's name fairly recently, because with you know wind and solar, you also need a backup plant. Do you have any thoughts on these small um, nuclear power things that are coming, being built? Mm -hmm. My thoughts, and it's funny, because we've heard the word nuclear, and we'll take all the scary stuff away, but in talking in an energy, energy standpoint, that conversation has bubbled up a little bit more in the past few years with climate change and finding renewable resources. This is kind of my just opinion on it. I think if it's done safely and securely, and that's the scary part, right? Because a lot can go wrong with that in a world of conflict or accidents even too. But let's take that very well out of the way. Nuclear energy does not seem to have a very large environmental impact on the space that the actual plant takes up. So I would say if it can be done safely and securely, again, my opinion only, um, it is certainly less environmentally impactful than 
burning tons of different fossil fuels, for it to be a coal, natural gas, oil, et cetera. So it's a possibility, but please, please, please be secure and safe. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, we're creatures of the problems. Um, we're well off, as you point out very well. We're also facing, it appears, um, identification. And apparently we've got some ability to move it around by the lake, so it's not all the old town, etc. But on your builder cap for a moment, and one of the three things that come to mind in building a sustainable community of, let's say, 200 houses, how do you do that? 200 houses? Yeah. It depends on those. 100, 200, we've got 100 and some odd. I don't even know where they're in Brandwood, we've got mm -hmm. Glendale opening up, etc. And no one's talking about a sustainable community. I don't get it. I think I, it's a great point you raise. I feel like, uh, coming back to what someone else in the crowd mentioned earlier, we have this kind of psychological societal expectation where, hey, at least if you're lucky enough to afford this, you want your space, you want your bigger house, you want your bit of yard, you want your big driveway, you want your double garage door. And okay, that's what we've kind of been conditioned to find as a new normal. So these are the developments that we're getting presented with. A developer, in my opinion, unless you're you know, really uniquely looking at things differently, most developers, they're not quite. They're not quite interested in the eco-friendly option. They're trying to maximize that space and maximize their profit. So I think there needs to be. Again, this could be. You bring up a good point. This could be a point, And unfortunately, I think we all know in this room, no matter where you stand on Ford, and that's fine if you like it or don't. But what I'm saying is, his government has clearly made, made it very painfully clear that. Um, Development without an eco mindset or an eco friendly mindset is not a high priority. He's actually making it easier, as we learned last week, for developers to build what and how they want just to do it as quickly and as profitably as possible. And a lot of developers see including ecological features as a financial burden to them. Um, so I think if we ever get another government in power, federally or provincially, kind of like I talked about how government should treat farmers, government should also treat developers the same and say, hey, we need you, or we're going to legislate you to develop an eco-friendly, you know, suburban sprawl, whatever it may be, and it must contain these features if you're going to do business and develop in my province. <laughs> Would that day come? It's not going to be easy, but it could if you have the right people in power. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I know there's lots of questions. That's okay. Yeah, for time, I totally respect the time, everyone here, so we have to wrap it up. I can so say you can talk to you. tell you about his passion? <laughs> right into what he's all about. To ignite curiosity and respect for our natural world through accessible, interactive, and educational programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I echo my thanks.